Hi. Hi. Okay, are we audible? Swanamala, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, guys, can somebody give us a thumbs up if you're audible? Okay. Thanks, Kapila. Okay, thank you for uh, making time to do this. Uh, I know that you're super busy. So, you said you had something until 8 o'clock, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was moderating something. Yeah, I was moderating a webinar. Yes. Right. Believe okay. it or not, um, contract management. Oh, yeah, that your mother was conducting, right? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, lovely. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce you. Based on the bio that you sent, I sort of reworded it just a bit for... Uh, um, so for those who don't know, Dr. Swarnamalia Ganesh is a storehouse of many identities and each of them affect, inform and impact each other. A performer who's equally passionate about the performance, the process and the performative traditions, Swarnamalia is also a researcher and a revivalist. She's also an academic who works as a professor of practice at the Kriya University. We've seen her on television and in cinema. Um, over the last two and a half months, ever since the lockdown, um, under the umbrella of the Ranga Mandira Academy and from the Attic, which is her performance, lecture and exhibition series, Swarnamalia has been rigorously engaging with students of dance and dance enthusiasts and curating a whole host of workshops that have ranged from the history of Varnam to interdisciplinary views of Rasa and Dwani, including a workshop that I particularly like that's titled Duncan Dance which is for children between the age group of 4 and 16, where uh, kids get to learn a Kuravanchi dance, engage in some craft, and also play some games. Um, thank you, Swarnamalia, for uh, being with us as part of the Lockdown with Weekend series. Thank you very much, Akila, for, for such a wonderful and warm introduction. You know a lot about me and what I do, uh, more than, you know, uh, many other people because you know you are uh, you are in the thick of the culture scene and uh, you know we are in many ways colleagues mm, who work Absolutely. perhaps at different ends of the spectrum but work on the same spectrum um, and I've also sure. greatly admired your dynamic work and I'm very happy to join you uh, this evening for with the Hindu weekend uh, series thank you lovely I truly appreciate that um, so I'm going to dive in straight uh, to this questionnaire that I have. And I thought I'd stop at about 9.40 and we'll throw it open to uh, some questions from the audience as well. Um, so Swarna, when you just posted about, when you posted this poster on your Facebook, you talked about how you've been in the public eye since age 17. Mm -hmm. um, surely that comes with a lot of baggage and a whole host of challenges and responsibilities. I'm keen to understand what have been the key takeaways by virtue of being in the public eye. And when did you actually realize that with great power comes great responsibility? Right. Um, I mean, I'll just take that question in the reverse. So for a very long time, I didn't realize that being in the public eye was power. Because I don't think uh, this, that was the generation. Uh, and that wasn't even long time ago. You know, we were still, I, you know, I'm still a millennium kid. But to think that, you know, the last, the 90s and till the 2000 or even 2004, five, uh, social media as such was absent. So the idea that your uh, existence in the public eye is power was, uh, was not knowledge to me, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in many ways, uh, the duty and the responsibility was the one that was constantly reminded uh, to me of because uh, wherever I went, people would reach out and... Uh, you know, especially when I was very active in films and television, uh, there was a huge, and those were the days of autographs and, you know, that sort of crazy, um, you know, fan moments. And that's yeah. when I realized here comes, you know, a certain responsibility. However, I was 17 and between my 17 and 23 and 25, maybe even, um, I had no clue what I was riding on. And I just did that. I just did that as it was part of my life. Only to yeah. sort of turn back when I was maybe 30 or to, to look back and say, hey, a better part of my life has been spent in yeah. front of people. And uh, people have seen me go through everything from my happy moments to my challenges. And they've had, they've all had opinions of who I am, what I should Absolutely. be, what I could be and what I'm not. Right. And, <laughs> and uh, I think 
also the fact that we were not that aware and there was no social media to really tell your story as such absolutely right i think that added to part of the whole idea that it doesn't matter what people really think i mean there are lots of people who think very kindly but i'm sure there are a lot of others who who have a hazar opinions about who i am but in my view because i came from that non social media age i don't feel the need to speak up i don't feel the need to share the story because there is no the story right it's my life right. and so i just lead, lead my life in that sense so right. so i guess to the largest part it's been i've been unaware but the responsibility part i think that crept in as i became a teacher not before that I, I was very footloose and fancy free until my teacher Sarasama actually told me, "Hey, what the hell are you doing? So many people know you. Why aren't you? All my students have to start a class. Why aren't you starting one?" And I said, "No, I don't think so." And she said, "No, you are starting one, and I'm coming to inaugurate it." And that's how this whole journey began. Okay. okay. <laughs> and then wow. I realized I have a, a response. But my mother has always, constantly, from a very young age, told me, "You have to be uh, responsible for other people, etc." You know, she's always told me that I have to be a role model, yeah. which I found as a huge burden. Must say, right. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, it is. It can't be really easy. Um, uh, you also talked about how, like, despite you know, you're really vocal on so many things that you feel passionately about. But you also talked about how you're inherently actually a very private person. Mm -hmm. um, was there a conscious decision? Um, did life sort of teach you to be that way? Like, what? I mean, how did you? Are you inherently? A, I'm just curious about. No, it's very interesting. I think it's a very interesting combination. So, if you look at one of my early and very popular works in television, which was called Lila Mai Pudumai, and it ran for so many years, seven years, I think seven, seven yeah. and a half years, continuously in, on Sun TV or whatever. So, the the show was tremendously dependent on my. my gregariousness so to speak right so i was i had to be an extrovert i was an extrovert i would laugh for everything i was 17 and i was 18 <laughs> whatever you know just laugh at any inane joke that can't make sense to me today right but i would laugh at the drop of a hat literally and i used to love all the crazy jokes and just like stupid things silly happy things right and that's who i am i mean to the largest extent uh but i think also life over the years Mm, taught me to understand even though you know it doesn't in to a large extent affect me but i'll be wrong and i'll be very uh, diplomatic in saying that it doesn't affect me at all so it does affect right when people make harsh judgments on you and especially when they make it a point to let you know about it right so over the years i think somewhere my challenges allowed me to clamp up a little bit and i remember one particular day after some few years of facing quite a few challenges i woke up one morning and i felt particularly very down because i realized i hadn't laughed the way i used to laugh on those sets in many years years right and so that's when i realized oh gosh i have actually matured up right so i don't think i'm a particularly sort of private person in that sense i mean i share a lot with my students and people i know well so i'm not that sort of clamped up kind of person yeah. but i think to the public I've largely allowed people to come to assumptions. It really doesn't affect me because I realize that you can't change people. If you can't Absolutely. change families and friends, and where are you going to start with public? I know exactly, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, coming to the actually the core idea of this discussion, which is really you've had your fair share of challenges, and I'm not going to get personal and ask you to speak about them, but I want you want to understand from you. how have you learned to cope with each of them and um, how have you uh, found pleasure in it in some sense and right. also be able to share that pleasure with a larger universe you know right. through all the challenges that you've been through um well you know i mean when we were discussing about what we should call this and when we used the word pleasure and i thought how ironic right i mean uh, people somewhere someone is saying how can there ever be any pleasure in uh, amidst challenges not in challenge but amidst challenge right yeah. uh, but you know, you know i mean i actually right now the 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 quote from uh, brech i think really comes to my mind where he says uh, you know i think that was one of the one of the very famous quotes of his and he says um, uh, will there in the dark times will there also be singing 
And then to which he says, yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. Right? Absolutely. So, <laughs> so I guess, I guess somewhere um, we all rely back on what we, uh, what we truly feel at the very core as our identity. We hark back to it at the, at the, at the moments in life where nothing mm -hmm. else, all that, all that fluff withers away. You know, my social media presence or, or any several other aspects of my life, all of these make sense to an extent where there's normalcy or some semblance of normalcy. But when mm -hmm. even that withers away, and that's a real challenge, right? I mean, see, mm -hmm. I, I can fairly say that COVID is a challenge. It's, it's definitely a challenge, but being privileged and being in that class of privilege I have to admit that it's not that big a challenge for me. I mean, I, yeah, I'm alive, sure. I have a roof over my head and, you know, I have three good meals a day and I have help. So, I mean, that is not my challenge. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, that's not a challenge that I would admit I have, right? It's, it's, it's definitely a challenge, but it's not the challenge, right? So when I've had the challenges in my life, when, you know, I've absolutely been sort of like brought to my knees, so to speak, I've realized that the one thing that has, gotten me back on my feet there are two things one is of course my family which have been like amazing but sometimes family fails too because you know you you realize that people can't help you and that's when i i remember distinctly one incident where i was lying on the in the hospital bed and this was not particularly for a physical ailment but an emotional trauma and you know people were wondering if i'm going to wake up and i remember distinctly uh, lying on that bed and I had conceived of a, a, a production that I wanted to do and you know I had actually done everything all the nitty gritties in my head lying down lying in that hospital bed right and that's when actually I realized this is it this is this is my thing I mean I may yeah. be good at it I may not be so but what what is good and what is not yeah. so good right if it can wake you up from that hospital bed then that's the best thing that you can do so that's wow. how I see love. So I will continue. And I think all of us in that sense, we all do. I think this Have is our, our own mechanism. Yeah. 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 We, to, to say that I find pleasure in my challenge is by itself a way to cope with that challenge. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that quote. Huh? I, I think it's also very relevant to the times that we are in. To be able to yeah. sing, of the, sing about the dark times. Right? Isn't so it? I mean, we're, we're always just that. Yeah, people are constantly saying, hey, why are you people singing and dancing? But hey, this is our way of coping. And this is how history will remember COVID. Absolutely. It is through the song, dance, conversation, people who make art, that history will remember COVID. Absolutely. You said it. Um, you know, uh, Swarnamal, I also remember reading that on the first day of Ramzan this year, you tried to fast. I'm yeah. curious about, uh, you know, uh, did you manage to sustain it? How was that experience? Was that like a self-imposed challenge? I'm just curious about like, um, you um, know, that post. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, I mean, I, this was my first time. I, I mean, I've obviously I've, I've done other kinds of fast, but never one that required me to not drink a drop of water and actually do it towards a particular sort of purpose. Right. And yeah. my partner is Muslim. So uh, okay. I've always been very curious to understand how, yeah. uh, how, you know, I mean, again, I am, um, I am a deeply cultural person and for me religion all religions interest me but I don't particularly and I've been brought up like that in my family I come from a sort of a very sort of liberal progressive family thanks to my grandfather yeah. and all of them so right. for me religion stops where it's it has a social institutional sort of uh, need because that's where it gets very complicated. But yeah. I really enjoy religion as a foundational sort of thought and philosophy. And so therefore, Absolutely. I really love to engage with all religions as much as I can. Yeah. So to me, this was a, this today, this year was exciting because I, I got to uh, not just fast for one day, but I think I tried for about eight days. And wow. it, was, it was quite transformative uh, in the sense that uh, it allowed me to experience a different culture. And I, I always yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. Um, no, when I use the word activist to describe you, uh, Swarna, you specifically said that that's a really very big word. And, um, uh, you know, it, it comes with a lot of responsibility. But, but to me, and to I'm sure to so many people who are watching um, the show, 
we definitely think of you as an activist also because you've been at the forefront of many a cause including gender based issues and of course the more recent me too movement yeah i really want you to talk about why it is imperative for people who are in the public domain and who have the ability to articulate and take a stand why is it important for them to really speak up yeah um you know i was just watching um, i think it was megan markle just a few hours ago talk about the black lives matter and she said the only the only wrong she was wondering if she had anything a uh, right to say and then she ended it by saying the only wrong thing to do right now is to not to say anything right so there are such moments in life where yeah. whether you're a public person or someone with any form of influence and we all have some influence or the other right i mean that is inclusive of people who don't have a public persona but also are you know the elders in the family are influencers to their children all of us have some influential position so often you know it's very important for us to speak up because we become implicit and complacent to what is happening especially when it's a social injustice if we don't speak up so for example if we want to talk about say caste uh, my sister always says unless you actively negate and speak about the the evils of caste you're somehow part of the system right so you need to have that conversation at home you need to have mm. that conversation with people you don't have to scream about it from rooftops i mean i don't do that i don't obviously talk yeah. about everything that i feel passionate about of because course. i'm also by nature not that argumentative although i come from a family of lawyers i somehow mm-hmm. you know i don't feel That's the like, need yeah. for an argument in a public forum sometimes because i feel like again you can't change everybody and that's not your yeah. you shouldn't spend your lifetime doing that right that's yeah. too much of a waste but yeah. having said that i think all of us have that moral responsibility right and opinions are going to be opinions that is whenever there is going to be any any social um social sort of moment where you know the society has to stick up and speak up there are going to be at least a few naysayers but there are certain things particularly that i'm passionate about like gender particularly during yeah. the me too right one thing i realized was um you there is there is no right and wrong there you know there could be gray areas no doubt you know from case to case but on the general umbrella there are there is a rule which is don't don't mess with other people's personal space it's a very simple Absolutely. rule right so for me it was under that sort of very primal and we're all women we know what yeah. we go through Absolutely. right so it this is not the it is not below anybody it can have it, it it has and it can happen to the best of us that when i say best i mean the ones who are vocal and who have all the sort of For sure. uh, you know right atmosphere to tackle it right so uh, so i just for me it's that cause when when it hits there when it hits my comfort zone and when i realize not speaking up is as criminal as as you exactly. know just yeah you can't be a stand bystander for everything you know if it, so so that's when i speak up uh, also of course i mean i by nature i think i'm very passionate uh, towards anything to do with gender my i think also my own education as a social scientist etc yeah. has, has always given me that bend of mind but i i did say don't call me an activist because you know i recently was watching um hannah gatsby and i love her you know in her douglas new show and she said yeah. you know <laughs> so petroleum you know when you call it petrol it's by by definition it's a liquid and you know americans call it gas and by definition gas is not liquid so similarly oh. <laughs> you know similarly an activist has to be active and you can't just be active on social media and call oneself an activist and for the largest part right. influencers only get to do that i mean that's right. important but that's not important all, yeah right so the people yeah. who get to the grassroots who are actually doing ground work they are the activists and so to me we can add and lend strength to their work unless i right. roll up my sleeves and get on the floor and actually. work with them so to me then yeah. i'm an activist until then i'm not i actually have a wonderful activist at home so i really know what activism is and it's not what right. i do i am an influencer at best right i mean i mean need those as well right they are equally important of course of so, course so i'm saying we all have to do our bit we should yeah. all do our bit and um, we're all influencers absolutely um you know uh, but empathy is at the core of you know speaking up 
uh, whether you're an influencer or you're an activist. And if you want to reach out and if you want other people to reach out to you, they need to definitely feel they are safe, right? Mm -hmm. And they feel, they need to feel that they can trust you with their story and they need to feel that they're going to feel comforted when they share that story with you. I'm curious, um, Swarnamali, if you can talk about how does one cultivate that empathy? Because mm -hmm. that is really at the core of everything that you do. Yeah. And uh, why is it especially crucial to the world that we live in now? That's actually a great question. And I often think, you know, I mean, um, in fact, just the last few days, I've been speaking to someone and I've realized that uh, over these years, at least those of us who have, uh, who've had the moments to stop by and see, you know, first we were speaking about altruism as a very important trait in human beings where you need to get down and help. And then we said, hey, you know, altruism is okay, but you know, we also, it's, it's, it's far more important to identify with their uh, with with anybody else's sort of what they're going through, right? And that we call as empathy, right? Uh, but then we've left behind another very important sort of word, which is called sympathy. And I keep asking myself, is sympathy not something that people want? And we always say, oh, I don't want I don't want sympathy. sympathy. Yeah, I don't want your yeah. sympathy. I want your empathy. So I keep asking myself, does someone need your empathy all the time or is sympathy also useful? I mean, if it's not at all useful, why even have that sentiment, yeah. right? And um, sometimes we need to, we need to know where to balance between sympathy and empathy because sometimes just keeping quiet and not really relating to their issue, but saying it's okay just from afar as a sympathizer is important because sometimes that's all you get to do because you'll never know what it is to be in their shoes. But right. There are many a times when I think what we as, um, as people who experience, see, we all experience, uh, you know, in this especially diverse world, unless we are in a very insular world where it's just you, yourself and your family, right? Most of us have a very diverse life, yeah. right? We, we move with different people. It's not very hard to start looking at life through multiple lenses. It's not very hard. I think what we do over time is because we are fed with so many sort of preconceived notions about our cultural, uh, you know, norms, that disallows us that empathy. We know what is honestly right, but it's, it's in that moment where you have to say uh, the right thing to be empathetic versus choosing between confirming to your cultural norm that you slip up. So for me, the cultural norm really only follows. Yes, it's very important. I mean, especially as someone who is an artist, etc. I know how much the idea of culture and cultural norm dictates my practice. But when it comes, when a push comes to a shove, I will put uh, humanity ahead of that cultural norm. I don't care. So that's a choice I've made, right? For example, yeah. you know, when when a student asks me, I remember, you know, we're all sort of today talking about the elephant that has been killed and yeah. oh and uh, you know, all of that, right? Yes, it's very, very, it's very sad. Yes, but I, and I'm someone today did a piece somewhere I saw about Gajendra Moksha and how humanity has failed and where is the Vishnu, etc. It's very moving. Okay. I mean, there's no doubt. It's a very, it's a very, it's a very sad and moving moment. Right. But I was thinking, hey, you know, a crocodile, it's a crocodile's job to come and um, you know, catch hold of a prey, right? To kill the crocodile, you know, with this superpower and to save the elephant because the elephant cried out to God, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very sort of a moralistic, cultural, normative yeah. way of looking at this whole thing. It's the crocodile is meant to do that. And in some crazy way, that's what we call as dharma. That's what we define as dharma. So I think in my head, all of these things, yeah. so I don't really easily take too much of a stand. I empathize with both sides. I mean, yes, the crocodile needs to survive. Yes, the elephant also needs, but how? That's not ecological balance. So I think empathy is like that. You will, you will have a little, unless of course it's a really no gray area kind of a me too moment or whatever, where mm -hmm. there is no yeah. right and wrong, but there's only a right. No, yeah. Right? Absolutely. Then, you know, your empathy really <laughs> allows you to be fluid. Right. I mean, that's a really interesting um, observation because, you know, um, uh, this, I, I like the distinction that you made between empathy and sympathy, right? We've almost become like if somebody says sympathy, we're almost like refusing mm -hmm. it, we're saying, no, 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 I'm not seeking your sympathy, but I'm looking for empathy, right? So, Sometimes I like sympathy, Atila. I, I really wish people will be sympathetic because you, you don't know my life. 
right so i'll be i'll be happy if you say oh you must be going through a difficult time i can't understand it but you must be that's, that's beautiful yeah i mean uh, you know i was talking to a friend uh, just a couple of days ago and she was just asking me how life has been and i was telling her that i don't have help and it's it's definitely tough sure. and but i immediately like corrected myself and i said no 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 but it's uh, is i'm definitely privileged and you know i shouldn't even be talking about this but she made this really interesting point um, swarna malyan she said hey but don't beat yourself up of course your problem is still yours and what you're feeling is um, i sometimes think that in our uh, we 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 keep reminding ourselves of our privilege but i also feel that sometimes we end up also being unsympathetic to our own selves because we are always trying to say like oh, we're not supposed to um, you know somebody is like in a worse state than we are yeah. but that doesn't take away from the or uh, the the agony that we the are agony, in the challenges sense. that we have no no i completely agree with you you know in fact i do think i think i think what we realize is when we talk when we talk about our own challenges the, the everybody is privileged in some way or the other unless you're truly marginalized Absolutely. and you're at the margins right we're all privileged yeah. at varying degrees and yeah. acknowledging part of acknowledging that privilege is also a tiny part of that is self preservation right you can't allow yourself right. to be beat blue black you know and that doesn't help anybody's cause if you want to acknowledge your privilege and help someone else you first have to self preserve absolutely that's crucial yeah um so i want to talk to you about um, you know from the attic which is your for those who don't know swarnamalya's performance ex- exhibition lecture series based on her research on uh, the reconstruction of lost dance repertoires of mm-hmm. early modern south india the naik period um has been sustainedly focusing on two important values swarna inclusivity and harmony how do you keep reiterating this rather important narrative right and inclusivity and harmony are important in almost everything that we do mm-hmm. uh, could you talk about why you pick these two values specifically to sort of you know focus your narrative on interestingly i didn't pick these they found me so you know as i finished my or as i i mean when i can't say finished but as i was coming towards the draw of writing my doctoral research and sort of uh, i was reconstructing and now i actively call it deconstructing because uh, you know there are many things that i had d- done differently since the time i reconstructed but nevertheless it is it is in many ways reconstructed so this entire project started speaking to me uh, only these two central themes one was that you know in a world today where we speak so much of the modernity right of the new the new generations contributions to culture and culture building is such that you know that yeah. it will keep building itself right and i keep i kept asking myself where is it building from i mean it, there needs to be foundational you know aspects on which it's building and these foundational aspects over the several years have we've been told is from sort of the you know a historic time in memorial times but those are very vague markers for us in the real world Absolutely. so i wanted to understand the real moments and the real places from where we found what we today are building on which is the ark and to me right. it was fascinating to realize that these are places of the immediate past which is the early modern era so you know we are not the creators of modernity but they were and in many ways they were bringing together their experiences of several decades and centuries of of cultural practices from from so many different cultures right and now we have also some people before me have said oh this is assimilation right we assimilate from all cultures and we make it our mm. own now that yeah. too to me is wrong because you know when you ask when you simply just make everything a hotchpotch and say i have assimilated it all you are somehow wanting to erase their originality and their origins yeah. right yeah. so to me the idea that it is it is inclusive yet it is also diverse so within mm-hmm. that inclusivity there are all these multiple strands and they exist as they are for the, for the world to see that it yeah. is this is where you may be able to draw the parallels of assimilation or whatever that you want to call it sure. i don't call it that anymore but you know but the 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 inclusivity is inclusive of the diversity 
so to negate diversity to me was one of the greatest i think one of the greatest things that nation state has done like the 21st 20 late 20th and early 21st centuries you know we continue to do right so for me these found me so the way i looked at my own self as a person and my practice and my research all of this was just sort of stitched together only by these two values of uh-huh. being inclusive as well as uh-huh. being completely diverse i i am not part of all of that diversity but just the fact that i'm part of this movement where there are so many strands of culture that parallelly exist they do give and take from each other but they exist yeah. they exist as they are and in acknowledging that i think i i somehow enrich myself Absolutely. right so to me those were the two two things that spoke to me i didn't go looking for them they came so every every reconstruction i did every piece of work that i tried to put together in that in that research kept going back to these two principles and mm-hmm. harmony of course is at the center of this whole idea of diversity right so i mean if you realize that there are multiple people and multiple voices and if you still choose to allow them to exist as they are that is harmony Then, yeah. Instead of trying to fuse them, conflate them, and then trying to like do a one man up ship, that's where disharmony really comes, right? Allowing everything yeah. to thrive, ebb and flow, coexist. Yeah, coexist. Yeah, I think that's such an important value for like in life, life right? Itself. Inclusivity and harmony. Yeah. Mm. I want to go back to empathy, um, Swarna, and talk to you about how, by virtue of being an inherently empathetic person, and have cultivated empathy. you also tend to contextualize your dance through gender culture society stigma political mm-hmm. movements like your bio your bio data says why is this important and how does that make dance more relevant to the times that we are in um you know i think art any art production is relevant to any time it is being made because it is being made by a contemporary person right a person who lives in that space so even those people who do not acknowledge the presence of society the presence of politics the presence of any aspect of gender whatever by not acknowledging it they are still making a very huge statement that too is political Absolutely. so being a political yeah. is a huge political statement right being yeah. age you know what i mean right so to me every art production you know if you do it in 2020 if you do it today it has a particular contemporary relevance of the day so in that sense every one of us are making art that is completely relevant so it can never be irrelevant i think what what allows me though uh, what interests me rather is is how you know i be used we can use particular lenses that are that are part of your identity to me mm-hmm. my identity largely stems from today at least you know i mean once my identity was all that laughter fun and not that it's not there but you know in 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 much more limited sense you know as you grow older we all tend to sort of become slightly more sort of serious in many ways and you know when my people my friends usually joke they look at my phone book and they say all your friends are like 80 plus what kind of a sad <laughs> life do you lead you know that sort of thing and they, they look at the kinds of books i i think i stopped reading non fiction like years ago almost like couple of decades ago so i read like serious as they say serious shit <laughs> oh <laughs> so, god oh, i know right so 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 i guess we're all dictated by those choices that we make and the and the personality that we develop so my interest in archaeology and my interest in looking at archaeological projects not speaking back to culture but speaking back to society looking at how you know manip- how different forms can manipulate society and people and uh, manipulate patriarchy these are all these are all these are all my personal interests in the way i choose my clothes in the way i choose my my food in the in the life choices that i make yeah. uh, you know Absolutely. in the books i read right so naturally it feeds back into my heart uh so right. you know that is who i am and therefore it it will be relevant it's there are also people who put away all this right they may have very interesting personalities but they stash it all away to to sort of like sort of insulate themselves into this world of whatever artistic imagination which is sort of stuck in time right i mean right. most dancers when they do you know when they don't speak about culture when they don't speak about anything political or anything of yeah. whatever i speak right, right? 
I keep th they keep thinking they've achieved something by not speaking about it. But what they don't realize is by not speaking about it, they've spoken louder. That is emblematic of what this larger environment is. And therefore, that feeds back into me speaking. So this is a, so it's, a, it's, a it's a very interesting cycle. Right. Um, so I know just as a colleague in the space that we are in, I mean, is the, is the arts world a bit too serious? Have we lost the ability to laugh? When did we ever have one? I, I assume, I presume rather, right? I mean, at least in the world that you and I have been born into uh, in our times, I haven't seen, everybody has a chip on their shoulder. I think we need to lighten up a lot. Yeah, right? We need to take absolutely. it easy. We need to learn. See, that does not mean being unkind, right? I think today the, the social media world has taught us that there is a huge difference uh, from, you know, between being lighthearted and humorous versus being, vitriolic, um, angry, and uh, sort of spiteful and hateful, right? I think you can, you know, and today with, with so many challenges, you know, everybody's mental health is fragile. So it doesn't augur well to hurt people. What are you yeah. doing? Right? I mean, why do you have private messages and why do you have inboxes if everything you need to spew has to be done in public eye? Right? So I think those are all distasteful. Yeah. But uh, aside of that, I think we need to we need to learn to laugh. I mean, we need Use to learn to laugh, laugh. right? Yeah. yeah, I think it'd be fun if we actually get a generation of people who don't take themselves too seriously. I don't take myself too seriously. Uh, so I mean, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I, I allow. I mean, I wouldn't even say I allow. I mean, I have students who who I mean, in the private who who joke and troll me, you know, for fun. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't care. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Swarna, are you a feminist? Because people use that word so randomly. Uh, what is your take on the on the word feminism? Yeah, I think if I'm not um, if I'm not patriarchal, I automatically am feminist, right? Uh, but then, what is not patriarchal? All of us are part of the system. So, in some ways, I think all of us become complicit in patriarchy. That said, I think I'm vocally feminist. But, you know, when I, the minute you, like you rightly said, the minute I say feminist, everybody, especially, you know, uh, most men tend to think that this is about radical feminism yeah. and just going out in the streets. And, you know, this is yeah. not about, uh, you know, the car burning right? kind of feminist. That's yeah. not. For me, feminism is, is at the core of humanity because you're looking at social equity, right? Something yeah. that has been denied to humanity. I mean, women are half the population in this world. I mean, if we if we were to take it that's in that sense, right? I mean, today, feminism has also, you know, has opened its doors to other genders. So which means today the fight of feminism or feminist theories is not anymore confined to the female gender, but all genders. So yeah. it is really a fight about equanimity, not equality. You know, there are biological differences. I don't want to go into those kinds. I mean, I'm not that kind of a feminist, right? And I don't think feminism is that. Feminist, feminism also is largely empathy, right? So if you're yeah. an empathetic person, if you're somebody who's inclusive, all those words that we just spoke about, right? If you're harmonious, that, right? you have yeah. to be a goddamn feminist. If you're not that, what the hell are you? <laughs> yeah, totally. Thank you for that. Uh, I just have one last question be before I open it out to the audience. Um, you know, I talked about how uh, busy you've been during this lockdown, you know, right from literally from the first week of the lockdown. Um, I'm just curious about what went into the choice of those ideas that you've actually engaged with students. And uh, what would you think, uh, Swarna, is your, you know, USP, what sort of, um, uh, sort of distinguishes you from the, there are a whole bunch of online workshops happening. What would you think um, is sort of your distinct quality in that sense? Right. Uh, actually, the lockdown uh, sessions or uh, the Facebook live courses that I began, uh, began really, I began them really as, uh, as basically to break down my own lockdown blues because I realized I had self-quarantined my, I just returned from Australia and I'd already been on a 14 day self-quarantine even before the lockdown began. So okay. I had already, my lockdown had begun long time ago before that, yeah. right? So it was really getting on to me. And I realized that I had to reach out to my own students. And that's when I realized also that, you know, people were getting very hot and, uh, you know, very debatey on social media, which is something I always, why I just look at it and I walk, I walk away. But now I was forced to look at it because I had a lot more time. time. And I realized, hey, this is such a, such a waste of energy. 
and uh, you know i mean it's so negative uh, yeah i mean i Spent could turn off notifications yeah. yeah i could turn off notifications and walk away but then <laughs> if i was going to do something for my students i realized it it may be a it may be a nice way to sort of uh, forge more friendships instead of burning bridges so that's really how i began and so i just thought hey what if i just do a one hour conversation very sort of open ended uh, with a lot of interaction with dancers from around the world who are interested in really so we were doing very serious topics like rasa and dhwani and very and these were not just for dancers so we looked at poets and artists and basically anybody who was within the realm of literature and poetry Mm-hmm. right and perform performed yeah. arts visual arts whatever like i had architects and other people come in so yeah. it's very interesting to forge new friendships uh to for them to understand that here is someone who is who is uh, i mean i won't say look i mean i don't believe in the concept of knowledgeable because what is knowledgeable right you continue to gather all the time so i can't say i'm knowledgeable but i'm very interested in the pursuit of knowledge and that makes me someone who's on the path right and i'm when i'm willing to take colleagues and friends along with me it makes my journey very very interesting i have someone to talk to and yeah. it makes their journey interesting because i have been on that path for a few years so i know the way a little bit right so i'm taking them through that with yeah. me and in the meantime if we are sort of it's almost like treasure hunting so it was a lot of fun for us yeah. right it's and just, yeah. what it really did for me was also get younger people who who did not know that it's possible to access many of these uh, sort of conceptual frameworks and intellectual traditions in a simpler manner not not to say that you can dilute dilute uh, sort of scholarship to just a facebook class yeah it's just the beginning but you need to begin somewhere and uh, you know without without really condescension and any kind of like a side uh, you know you know whatever like jibes and stuff like that it was yeah. good to have it was good to have happy friendly yeah. banters and conversations yeah. that really is how so i really think if there is a usp and i would know honestly but i think it would again be inclusivity and diversity because yeah. i can't think of uh, i can't think of myself as someone who subscribes to a yeah. ideology uh right. you know i i like multiple points of views i like disagreements as long as disagreements um they can be strongly worded but as long as they come from a place of a conversation wanting a conversation i always say yeah. an argument is wonderful if it has both a good premise and a vision yeah. right any argument without a vision or a premise is just it's just very very um it's just a use use uh, no not a good use of time yeah so Uh, so i think that would be my usp if at all right and i saw like lots of comments by the people who had sort of participated in it and i thought it was really a very almost imagine it like a drawing room conversation with a bunch of you know people just freely sharing their ideas yeah. and thoughts so i mean that's why i wanted to ask you this question sure. about yeah. so i'm that's going to um, throw the floor open for questions at this point if anybody has questions um we'll just wait for uh also somebody says the course was very interesting as well as informative yeah i think you're able to um um how okay, how was the concert with abida oh my goodness yes abida ji oh, wow. oh my god that was my that was my dream come true uh, really i didn't no no okay so back up i didn't perform with her but she was excited we were we are planning something but it was right. amazing to to be there at her concert okay, and actually okay. meet her because you see we i i couldn't go to islamabad just now because of all the uh, issues that are going on between yeah, india yeah, and yeah. pakistan but so somebody would like to know if we can call you an art activist um, swarna because no. um, you do get on the field and help heritage artists uh, since you said you don't consider yourself an activist can we can we call you an arts activist No I think there is no need for that nomenclature simply because I think I gain a lot more than I give right so I gain a tremendous lot from that it's it is it is uh it is not transactional because for me they're all my 
many of them have turned into my gurus many of them have turned into my my mentors all of these hereditary artists from the folk artists to the you know right. the, the 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 women from the devadasi community the 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 natavanars all of them but i gain a lot more from them than i would ever be able to give back so when i come from that Achoo. place and i think all activists also come from that place if you ask most activists who are on the ground you know they will tell you that they've gained a lot more from the community uh, but i would still refuse to call myself an activist because i don't do that full time it is definitely a huge part of my uh, everyday engagement but it's not the one one thing that i forefront so no i'd rather still call myself just an artist right um uh, swarna somebody would like to know how can we access the layered meaning of the tanjavur quartet um i think that was one thing that we tried doing at the um the uh, ripples of the quartet workshop that we did it was it was very interesting for us to um over 5 days uh, i've done quartet workshops every year um on site but to this year we ported it to online and it was very interesting mm -hmm. to have a good mix of students from across the world you know some of them waking up at 4:30 in the morning to be part of this so some serious level of commitment from them mm -hmm. right like brilliant right. brilliant dancers themselves each yeah. and it was very interesting for for me to to be able to share with them what it is to to have the music and then what it is to have musicality which is another complete layer and then to have that idea of of uh, you know really sort of unpeeling the 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 swaram and the sahityam and i just don't want to go into too many technicalities but there are multiple layers and whatever i shared there's so much more than that so one can go on it's a lifetime's pursuit honestly absolutely um so now somebody would like to know um uh, i mean i'll sort of paraphrase the question i guess she wants to know whether uh, people are headed to professional careers is it important to kind of um uh, focus on academics at the and arts at the same time to sort of make it to be successful i think that's what she sort of right uh, no that's a very um that's a good question it's also a difficult one it depends also see i also believe that uh i for either you must have an aptitude and by aptitude i don't mean inherent talent all of us are talented i don't believe any this art is made for any few or any one in particular so as long as you're willing to put in the hours and the kind of demands it makes on you anyone can do well but having said that you will be able to give in to those demands only if you if you feel like it's it's up to you that is you know it's your cup of tea so for that i think you need to test water so it is good to uh, sort of dip your toes in the academic aspect of the arts it's also good to look at sort of the the professional angle you know that is there are allied uh, there are so many allied professions to the art make up art making process right it's good to look at that it's good to also sort of dip yourself in practice but um, but ultimately you'll have to pick one and you can hmm. keep the others in tow but you can't sort of uh, you know i mean i'm traversing both but i will always say that my practice informs my my academics you know i'm not a primarily hmm. i wouldn't consider myself an academician meaning i have to bring everything i do to the dance floor so for me that is very important so yes it would be but today you know everybody wants to do a phd it really is not that necessary you know because you will realize honestly if you do a phd that you've just begun that journey of uh, of any yeah. academic endeavor right so it really, it's not the end so calling yourself doctor this or doctor that is not the end and i realized it after i got that doctorate it's a different thing but right. of course but yeah after know, being through yeah. yeah but but you know i mean yes academic you know it, it and there's no guarantee that you'll be a great dancer if you're a good academic right these are two right. different streams so unless you actually invest in uh, in in whatever you feel you have the aptitude then slim chances that one will help you or both will help you so right but do feel free to try everything i mean there are the crafts within the arts which are highly um, you know i think uh, left behind and neglected right so why not look at so many there are so many crafts there's so much avenue for uh, employment and professionalism there and professions right. really so um so there's a question from satvika Yeah. um uh with what kind of conscious choices do you make while creating your dance repertoire which is a reflection of your true identity um so i don't really that's a good question because i don't choose my dance repertoire with that sort of a conscious consciousness mm -hmm. 
although i mm. think sometimes when i make a production like for example i was telling you right i was lying on that hospital bed and i and i conceived of i didn't conceive of an entire production basically something kept coming into my mind the the tryst with destiny nehru's uh, speech at the midnight hour mm. right when india got mm. its independence kept coming mm. into my head for some reason don't know how why right yeah and then i created an entire production around that around speech right for me yeah. the idea that we are at the cusp of time and we've been at the cusp for 75 odd years now of uh, of a twist mm-hmm. with our own destiny and in our own yeah. personal lives also we are in that twist right with our own destinies so for me that really pushed me towards creating an entire production i looked at the idea of destiny from different aspects and then all of that right so that was a conscious maybe a decision uh but i don't i, I don't think i ever sit down and say oh you know i am a feminist at core so let me create one etc so i think by by nature if we are who we are and we're not afraid to allow our personality to creep in it's going to show up in our choices we don't need to make those conscious choices right um there's one question about uh, in challenging times or uh, what is most therapeutic dancing teaching reading researching what do you sort of um all of it all of all it of all of it yeah. and then also kicking back and doing nothing everything is therapeutic you need you need time out i mean i've taken Absolutely. time out for the last two weeks uh i don't know after that immersion workshop that we did which was very demanding i was so burnt out exhausted, right yeah exhausted mentally i remember sitting in my class the next day on zoom and i told my students can't do it sorry let's go and watch a movie or something right so yeah and swarna please say it again and again because we're all in this productivity game right oh, please gosh. say it again and again that it's okay to be kind it's, of it's not okay, productive okay. so that's... and you know what yeah you know what i'm being burnt out and accepting that you're burnt out and actually taking that time off will rejuvenate you and you'll actually feel normal and better to do more later so i yeah. think it's also a, i think it's also privilege that drives our overproductive sort of thing so we need to kick yeah. back we need to kick back this i think we'll we have time for just one question sure. and we'll take this one which says what's your take on changing the culture and repertoire of barney while performing uh, than starting with the traditional pushpanjali there are other options nowadays uh i'm not sure that's uh, well first of all it's not a one person job first of all yeah. and secondly why why will i do that thirdly um i don't even believe in the concept of bani that much my guru always said bani are they no now they have never used that word i remember sarasa amma would say bani ella onnum kadaiyadu pa you know that was like simply how she would <laughs> she would just brush it aside you know because right. for them you know they came from different places and she would and she had a wonderful example you know in tamil she would say uh, you know or panela saadam irukku sor irukku and the sor la endu neenga vaalu oru oru parka eduthu saapidringa vevvera taste ah varum ella ore panela endu vandad thane appadina so you know it was a very fantastic beautiful, yeah. yeah very beautiful way of understanding that but at the same time like i said diversity and the idea that there are multiple things and you don't have to change anything if you want to really not do pushpanjali and do something else if you want to start with the padam start if it holds the test of time who's stopping you if you're able to hold your audience who's stopping you right nobody is stopping you from anything we're all enough entitled to do whatever the heck we want it's only right. our own pressures that stops us from that our we own set on ourselves who the hell is stopping you start from wherever and people have been able to achieve some some sort of movement by doing that for example i mean chandralekha is a wonderful example of sort of breaking free of certain norms so if yeah. you stand the test of time then you should be doing it not me absolutely so i'm just one thing one if you want to say one thing to young dancers um uh, what would it be before we just sign off and thank oh. you for joining us it's one thing Please. that you want to kind of um whether it's for dancers or for young people or just a, all young people really yeah, yeah i just want to say set yourself free right set yourself free from the burdens of uh what you've been taught and i don't mean like knowledge but i mean sometimes yeah. knowledge is also hugely burdensome yeah. but all the norms all the sort of religious cultural political all of that that's weighing Baggage. you down right yeah. and i say that because if you are privileged enough to set yourself free then you have the duty to set yourself free 
because only when you set yourself free you will be able to even sort of begin to think what it is to have a life that's not got that choice and that's where is the first step of empathy so set yourself free Thank you so much. I really had such a fantastic time chatting with you. I've been meaning to do this for so many years, and I'm so grateful to the Hindu Akhila, weekend for giving me this. I must say that you know you are. I really, I really believe that believe that there's tremendous power in women. Um, you know, sticking up for each other and working Absolutely. together and really holding each other up. Right. I mean, for there's sure. no right and wrong. You know, women are awesome. right having said that you are a wonderful woman and i've really seen how you. dynamic you are and you have a great team and you know you do such amazing work so i i mean i i really enjoyed having this conversation with you thank, thank you so you. much sarna thank you to everyone who tuned in good night stay safe and see you soon bye bye oh, thank you very much i just log